What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with, or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made recording on this computer. Uh, make sure that we've got gallery. That looks good. Um, I think I'm just going to introduce you guys the way uh, I'm going to introduce you. How's that? Okay. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> All right. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back <laughs> to the Born or Made podcast. Um, today, I have two ladies on the show that I was so stoked to hop on their show. It's got to be, I don't know, maybe a year and a half two years ago, um, but uh, these gals have done some incredible things in the world of wellness. I would honestly go as far to say that they are kind of OG wellness entrepreneurs. Today, everybody's a wellness entrepreneur. Um, and when, when Erica Huss and uh, Zoe Sakudis started in the world of wellness, not nearly as many people were doing it. Um, in 2007, they co-founded a business called Blueprint Cleanse, which was, I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I remember like probably one of the first, if not the first juice cleanse companies, um, I think was also direct to consumer maybe then too. Um, direct to consumer juice cleanse businesses. This is like when wellness really started taking shape in New York City. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was like, it was something, it was just so unique. It was such a, it was such a, like, people were just like, oh, wait, so, so, so you drink these juices for seven days and like everything changes. And, and, and it, it was a real phenomenon at that time in the world of wellness and specifically in juice. Um, and now you guys have been partners for 15 years. You built this amazing business blueprint. <laughs> you, you exited that business. You took a little time and then you went and created another business. And I'm staring at this really awesome can right here, a uh, company called Earth and Star. It's a functional mushroom company. Uh, and you guys have done some really cool things. And I cannot wait to learn more about that. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce Erica Huss and Zoe Sakutis to the Born and Made podcast. Ladies, welcome. Thank Aww. you. I like that introduction. That was a nice girl. Yeah, we'll take the OG stuff. Um, so than dinosaurs. <laughs> at this point, you two are, I guess you can call yourself serial entrepreneurs. Um, you've you've built some really cool businesses. And um, you know, I'd love to just understand and learn from you guys uh where where you're at right now and like give us, a, give us a little background on your story and how this all came to be. Which story do you want background on first? I just want to hear I'm it. I want to, I, like, I want, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the way this show works and the reason why it's called Born or Made is I get to talk to awesome people like you who have done really um, extraordinary things and, an, has, and has influenced uh, a lot of people. And the idea of the, the, the name born or made is to really sort of dig into the nature nurture question, whether you two think you were born with an inherent ability to do what you do and get to where you've gotten, or if it was, if it happened through, you know, just grind hustle and determination. A lot of people would say both, of course. Um, however, I, and I agree that there, there's, there, you cannot do it without, without, uh, hustle and determination and hard work. However, I do think some people walk down a path, uh, like inherently where they're, they, and they can't really describe why they are going after something the way they are going after it. Potentially there was no one there motivating them. They were just, they were just drivers and they were going for it. And so I think that there is a level of this sort of born thing. Um, and so the way we like to get there, 
uh, is by listening to your story, hearing your story, and potentially extrapolating little tips, little tidbits and saying, why did you do that? Well, what made you think to like want to be the best in your second grade class, you know? Um, and so I think if we can go back there and sort of start yeah. looking at why that's, uh, that I think, you know, that'd be awesome. People love to hear stories. So let's go. I'm going to crack my earth and start too. Oh, isn't she pretty? She's such a pretty can. <laughs> yeah, she's a good looking can. You go again. <laughs> Oh, um, oh, a little, a little kick in the end there. I like that. I like that little, little, I like that. A little ginger in your ass. A little ginger in my ass. Oh, all right. <laughs> Let's go on that note. Um, all right. So why don't you kick it off? I, um, I don't know. It's interesting. Erica and I have very different, um, very different upbringings, right? She's a city mouse. I'm a country mouse. She's from, you know, Manhattan. Um, but it's funny because we actually met at, uh, we met in a very scrappy setting, which is, you know, classic uh, bartending, cocktail waitressing, that whole, that whole scene back in the early aughts. Um, Ian Schreger, that's how we met. Just slinging drinks, trying to make some money, begging people for 20%. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I know, know that world well. Huh? It went I, well. I know that world very well. <laughs> yes, you do. I used to patron your uh, your wonderful establishment as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, uh, in all seriousness, I don't know. I'm from Pennsylvania. Been in the city since I was like 17. Went to school here. Grew up in like the sticks um youngest of four siblings you see i was just like broad stroke it for you okay um and then you can tell me if you want more detail um but you know it's uh it's funny i definitely did not have any specific um direction when i went to school i was like you know i went to school in the city i was like and eh, i guess i'll major in communications because i have no clue what i want to do i kind of wanted to be in like i was interested in production and kind of like like the idea of like producing things, pulling shit together. Um, so you would but, say you're like, a, you're like, an, you, you enjoy organization. You're an organized person. If only you saw the shit show. Can I swear on this podcast? Right? Absolutely. If only you saw the, um, the, the state of my office right now. I don't know that you would call me an organized person. You might call me um, a person who has definitely like taken on too much. <laughs> And it's, Copy it's that. Totally different. Um, but no, yeah, I do. I like the idea of sort of like a lot of moving pieces and putting them together, um, coming out with something, you know, that that sort of uh, feels big. Um, but yeah, so I went to school for that. I did not have any specific focus, kind of started bartending, you know, to like make money. I didn't have any kind of uh, backup plan or back a bank account to get me through so it was definitely <laughs> very scrappy from very early on um i've always worked in the service industry since i was like nine ten i mean literally like washing floors um but um yeah and then there, there was just like a moment where um i was introduced to raw foods by my hippie boyfriend and um you know it kind of like took a very sharp turn where I was suddenly just like, I don't know, my mind was blown by this concept of like healing yourself with, with uh, plants. Um, and so, you know, I became a raw foodist, sort of went down the rabbit hole of, um, you know, nutrition and, and learning more about what it actually means to be, you know, plant, what we call now plant-based. But at the time it was really like, you're a raw foodist, you're basically eating like, sprouted, fermented, um, plant-based food, no animal proteins. Who was that um, really, <laughs> really wild dude in New York City uh, who like didn't eat for like, like a month at a time? He was in the East Village. Oh, the Breatharian? Yeah, yeah, he had a place on 12th Street. Um, yes. Uh, David Judd. Yes, I dated a girl. Judd. I dated a girl who like fell in love with this guy. 
I was like, wait, <laughs> that, I was like, that guy? And like, we were oh like God. at the Russian baths one day. Yeah. And she was like, that's, that's the guy. And I was like, that guy? <laughs> wait, you, you're ready to like leave me for that guy? And Annie. he was like, was, yes. Was her name Annie? It was Annie and David Jeff. Well, no, Annie, Annie, and Annie wasn't her name, but, but she was, oh. she was, I, I just, I, I, like when I, when I, yeah, he was, a, he was an interesting guy and, and, and yeah, but like, it was, it was like a cult. It was like a cult. I think um, she would talk <laughs> yeah, about, she would talk about Annie, I think. Yeah. His, his place was intense. He was definitely, I love that we're all, we're, well, at least you and I, Michael, are definitely like the East. I lived on like, B and six, I think at that time, or no, that was after I moved to Brooklyn. Anyway, but that was on 12th street. It was like all the raw food places were in the East village at that time. Like the first, the original ones, like live live, quintessence, jubs, high vibe. I mean, these guys need some branding help, but, <laughs> but yeah, I would go in, I would go in there and I've, at least once a week and get my like raw, creepy, like raw food snacks. And um, he was always behind the counter, like, giving me samples and he would never say like would you like to try this he would be like <laughs> he's like would you love some <laughs> would you love a taste it was just like a very intense uh, oh yeah that's game. it that is that <laughs> that's totally it but he yes and he was a breatharian so he would say but then i would like spy him just like you know wait can you wait i'm sorry can we just talk about a breatharian for a moment yeah what the yeah, fuck yeah. is a breatharian I don't fucking know. It's kind of bogus. I mean, I think he ate, he basically says he lived on like honey. It, I think this it was a lot about honey, <laughs> at least for him. I don't think it was like, you know, I can, I'm a human that can eat with or live without eating, but um, you know, he was sort of finding nutrients and, in, in uh, I guess, non-traditional ways. I don't know. I e the air. I don't know. He's a, he's a, he's a magician, I guess. I'm um, curious what he's doing now. Uh, I, I want him on the podcast, yeah, honestly. For sure. Yeah, I think that would be funny. Um, but yeah, it was a very extreme world to say the least. So you'd have like raw foodist and then a step up from that would be like a fruitarian, which means you only eat fruit. Uh, and then a step up from that, which would be David Dove, is like the breatharian. So I was definitely um, in the more sane camp. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that was a very interesting community at the time because it was like no one was eating let alone plant-based like no i mean even being a vegan was like what i mean you get so much shit it was incredible but now it's like just you know what's interesting so i started my my restaurant journey when i was 12 at a restaurant on the upper east side called the candle cafe the that candle was the cafe? first yeah. that was the first restaurant i worked at when I was 12 years old and you know I I would like to say that that restaurant left a massive impact on me because I live a I, I am truly for a long time I wasn't but once I got my shit together I reconnected with my passion for wellness um because as a young kid even as a very young kid I and I and I mean I eat a lot of meat now, um, but when I was a kid, I didn't eat meat. I didn't like meat when I was when I was young. Um, and my mother would like sort of make fun of me because I loved fruit and salads. All I wanted was salads. I didn't. I had no interest in sugar. I did not eat any meat, um, and it was probably because I had a really really gnarly experience. At, two gnarly experiences. One, a babysitter told me that tuna fish was fish guts, and so. Didn't want to do that. <laughs> Two, I was at McDonald's when I was probably like seven or eight, and I bit into a chicken McNugget, and it was a chicken foot. Yes, it was not really. Oh, yeah. What so that foot, in the head? foot, yeah. And you know, oh in some God. cultures, that would have been like score. Um, but for me, it was like, you know, basically death. Um, and so that just completely turned me off. And I also remember my my uncle was uh, an amazing barbecue master. And every holiday we would go to my, uncle, my, my aunt and uncle's place. I, I grew up in the city too, Erica, and, I, and we're gonna get into your story 
too, because I'm really interested to seeing what your city experience was like. But we, I grew up in Manhattan and my cousins lived in Long Island. So we would go to Long Island for like every holiday. What, no matter what the holiday was, we, were, we would just go to Long Island because it was like a vacation. And uh, my uncle was such a great barbecue cook. And so he would cook these chicken wings, but they had a lot of grizzle on them. You know what I mean? It was just like, there was a lot of like that, like that, that tendony sort of grizzly thing that just texturally creeped me out. And so I just stopped eating meat. And then I got the job at Kennel Cafe and I understood what it meant. <laughs> like, like I fell in love with kale. Like I, that restaurant taught me about sprouts and kale and like carrot ginger dressing <laughs> and, you know, uh, you know, carrot ginger soup. And I just remember so much. I, I, I really miso like that restaurant just really just, man, like it left a, such an impact on me. And I worked there for a while, I think for two years. Um, and I didn't eat any meat and I ate all, like all the food I ate was from Cano Cafe because I was there all the time. Um, but, you know, it's so interesting to, to see, like see how you, how people end up in these in these genres of, um, of, of business for, for us, right? Like, you know, it's, it's interesting. So Erica, yeah. tell me, tell me about your, about what it was like growing up for you. Me? Yeah. Oh, no, the other, say, the other, the other Erica. Same... <laughs> well, um, I had the same uh, experience with the chicken McNugget that it was like one and done with the whole, it wasn't actually foot, but it was definitely some gristle thing. That put yeah, it was like when you bite in. Yes, I had this experience that you bite into one and your teeth kind of like bounce yeah, off. Yeah, they like, like crunch on oh. something. Like yeah. tendony kind of disgusting. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. I was a vegetarian for a long time. I now do incorporate a little bit of meat here and there, but I've not touched chicken in I don't even know how long. I just find it, it's like the most useless meat. It's not delicious. It's texturally <laughs> totally freaky and it, I don't use for it. So, um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, grew up in, in Manhattan as well. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's interesting, Z, hearing your, the story that, that you're, you're in the path that you described in terms of like you're interested in doing producing because it felt like, you know, organizing, pu pulling a whole bunch of things together and creating something, um, which in so many ways we have very different upbringings. Like, you know, I was born and raised in Manhattan, only child, not the youngest of four, just the youngest, the middle and the oldest. Um, and I was a ballerina. I was super into just performance all the time from a very, very early age. I ended up going to college for theater, for dance and theater um, in, in Chicago. And, uh, but so I, when I got to college, I learned that I was not actually as talented as I had given myself credit for growing up. Um, I was like kind of a, not even a big fish in a small pond, but I went to like a very, you know, artsy humanities focused school on the Upper East Side called Hunter. Um, lots of like theater and, you know, performance kids coming out of there, but we were all sort of on par with each other. And then I went to this like very, very serious established theater program at college. And I was like, oh, I am so out of my league here. There is something else that I need to figure out. And the class that I got the most out of actually was stage management, which is exactly what you're just saying. I mean, it's production. It's like pulling all of the elements together and saying like, okay, you know, we need these cues here and we need this props <laughs> here. And really just having the whole kind of comprehensive overview of what a production of a performance and I loved it and I was really good at it. And I didn't actually necessarily wanna pursue that as a career, but it felt like the best thread to pull for me if I was going to ultimately go into you know, showbiz, um, which I did a little bit performance wise, but uh, this you know, in a similar way landed in hospitality because it wasn't that I didn't know what else to do so much as at the time it was my kind of plan it wasn't my plan b it was my like that was how i was actually making money while i was trying to do the theater stuff that wasn't panning out so well for me um and then fell in love with the hospitality world and i actually kind of always felt in some ways like it was it was theater in its own way it was very similar you had like you know the servers were kind of the talent and that's like right out in front of the audience and then you have like the managers that are sort of you know the director producer like there were all of these parallels and I, Can I just stop you there that. for a second. I feel like I yeah. have to interrupt because I think what you just said is so <laughs> true and intelligent, right? Like, you know, 
there are these restaurants um, and, 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 and being that we're all, we all have a lot of experience in the hospitality industry, like the great restaurants are truly like the great Broadway shows, right? They last forever. People come to visit them when they come into New York. Um, you know, they're, they're always busy. They're always slammed. Nobody can sort of say why. And it's really because there's somebody that in the background that is like curating this perfect blend of people that um, believe in something, you know? And like, I think as an actor too, right? Like in order to be really good at your job, you have to believe what you're doing. Like you can't, like, it's not real, of course, because you're acting, but you have to believe it. And like, I've listened to a lot of actors talk about this thing, right? Where like, they believe their character. They, they really end up believing their character. And so for the restaurants, you know, it's like the, the ones that put on the best show always succeed. And it's such an incredible place to, to build your character in the restaurant industry. It's like- I totally agree. It's like, I, I, I think I would not- be successful in my career today had I not spent so many years behind the bar in a restaurant. My ability to connect with human beings and to be comfortable in front of other human beings, to talk to whoever, whenever, wherever, about whatever, is all because I spent so much time in restaurants. And so anybody who would, who, who would knock a restaurant employee or say, oh, but what do you really do? It's like, actually, you know, it's an incredible job. And some of these people that are working in the restaurant business, specifically at the great restaurants, are making like 150 grand cash a year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Working like four days a week from like five to 12. And so yeah. I just, I, I, I think that was so, so awesome that you shared that because I agree wholeheartedly, right? Like the great restaurants are like the, are like a masterpiece and, and, and everything has to work really well. And it's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, it's choreography. It's orchestration. It's all of those things. It is, I mean, the ones that are running well, it feels like a dance. Um, but I think, you know, to your point, I feel like the skills that you acquire in the hospitality business, you don't even really understand what they are until they become applied later. Um, I mean, we, Zoe and I worked in like a pretty fancy, you know, kind of five-star hotel bar. So we were interacting with people who were you know, we were serving people who were at a very different place, very different level, very different world than the people we were working with and the people that were, you know, supporting us, the runners, the bussers, all that. And I feel like, you know, in all of my communications training as an actor, I didn't necessarily learn how to read an audience in the same way that I did, you know, waiting tables, because you have to deliver a message to somebody that you're dropping drinks for in a very different way than you have to deliver a message to the busboy who's helping you know clean up and and support you and i felt like that became actually really very um relevant and like palpable when we were running blueprint and it was the same thing you know we're servicing clients who are spending 65 dollars a day to not eat food and drink juice and that's a very different conversation than you have with your incredible team who's working behind the scenes, chopping lemons and celery all hours of the day for you know hourly wages. And you have to be able to really land your message on everybody, all of those people, everybody in between. That I think you know that that was the training ground for for something like that. I love this story because this is a real one, right? This is you guys going out there and, and you know, Zoe not, not having a, not knowing exactly what you wanted to do and Erica coming off like a, uh, you know, a, a childhood adolescence of like working towards something and then realizing that it wasn't actually going to work out. And so you guys ended up working in a restaurant and I'm assuming you guys are working in a restaurant together and that's where you met. Is that right? Yep. And then you, and then you. Day of training. Yeah. Oh, really? You guys met like you started at the same time? Oh, well, it was a new place. Yes. Uh, did we start at the same time? Oh, yeah. That's what I mean. We had training for the private park at the same time. <laughs> wow. Right. Um, so you guys meet in a restaurant and um, both find out, I'm, 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 I'm telling your story for you, but both find out that you kind of have this passion for this wellness thing and, uh, and say, fuck it, we're going to go out and try something. And <laughs> I think that that is such an inspirational story. I really, I like that story more than the story of, you know, I've been working my life to do this. 
Um, because what it says is you never know where you're going to run into your, you know, your, your life business partner. Um, and you never know where you're going to find inspiration from another person. Uh, and so, you know, keeping an open mind at all times is, is, you know, sort of what that message says to me. So how, how do you guys, when did it happen? When was it like, boing, this is what we're going to do? Well, Zoe was, to her credit and to her earlier point, she was, you know, coming into the service bar with her like weird little crinkly wrapper snacks um, that didn't have labels that, you know, from this like raw food underground that she she participated in that was really, um, you know, fascinating to all of us in like, you know, sort of mortal land. And um, I mean, I considered myself, you know, a health and wellness oriented person having a background, you know, with physical fitness and activity and dance and all that. But I was like, you got, you were talking before about the ranks. I guess I was like a bottom feeder vegetarian. <laughs> um, but she had this whole experience with this cleanse world and having to like go to, you know, Puerto Rico to study at an institute because you couldn't actually get the full experience of, you know, this raw food journey with juicing and and healing um you know on a on a program easily in new york and so i think that was certainly her light bulb moment was like this just needs to be accessible this needs to be available to people in a way that is just so much more presentable and you know like real life it needs to be a little sexy it needs to be something that you know you could actually feel comfortable carrying around in New York and not feel like you have to be on some random like resort, you know, in, in Puerto Rico in order to kind of, you know, do this thing. And so this is like 2006. And I remember still vividly to this day, you know, she is like, we went for like a walk. We went walk all around the city. It was like the middle of summer, walked all around the village. We went to like La Esquina and had some cocktails and whatever. And she's telling me this whole story of like, this concept, this cleanse, and this is the program, and here's what you need to do, and here's how it currently exists, and here's how I can see it kind of growing and existing. And I feel like that was the moment for me where I, you know, to your point, Michael, was kind of inspired by like, wow, this chick is like, you know, she's my friend, but like, I had no idea there was so much more of like, you know, this bigger kind of picture, this bigger brainstorm going on. And at the time I was then working like, part-time at the bar and working in PR and food and restaurant PR. And so, you know, we were kind of just like stayed in touch and sort of kept checking in on, on how the progress was going. And she was working with, you know, a, a raw food chef who shall remain nameless. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> um, and testing the waters a little bit and getting like a kind of a good core group of, you know, basically just guinea pigs, you know, this, this group of women to kind of give feedback and, and, and weigh in where it could be, you know, improved or tweaked or whatever. And I think it was at that moment, and I don't want to speak for you, Z, but it seemed like, okay, this actually does have legs. And now like, what do I need to know that I don't know? I know I need like this, that, the other, I know I need a press release. I'm going to ask my friend Erica what a press release is, because I think she knows. And I feel like that was kind of this moment of like, okay, this is something that, you know, now we need to take seriously. And it seems like we can really kind of complement each other's capabilities and let's just jump in. I love it. Um, Zoe, what for you was drawing you towards, um, like, do you remember why you felt you needed to make a business out of this passion of yours? Uh, I mean, you know, I saw firsthand a lot of healing and um, experienced it myself. I mean, I felt like I went from, um, you know, I went from carnivore to raw foodist overnight. And I've, you know, it just, it was an amazing feeling. Um, and so the more- Like what I changed? What changed? Like, I want to, I, I guess I want to dig into that a little bit because I think that's I mean, important. I mean, most- <laughs> most noticeable is like your energy level, um, digestion, um, you know, it's like all the little things like your skin is better. The whites of your eyes are super white. You have a ton of energy. You're never, it's like, you're literally just eating super clean. And I will also say that at the time, even though I was a raw foodist, it was also, you know, a 20 something living in New York city. And that was my playground. So I was very much like 
straddling these two worlds and having a lot of fun, like drinking uh, whatever alcohol and, and going out and running around, but I was also a raw food. So it was a very weird, like um, two worlds that were not totally intersecting. And so I think that was also a big part of it. It's like, okay, wait a minute. Why do you have to say like, sign on to one or the other like why can't there be some kind of intersection here like why is it that i go to quintessence like every day by myself and eat lunch <laughs> like it's so sad it's, it's lonely you know in the raw food world um, are you but, still a raw foodist no okay i mean i'm not i don't eat meat but i'm not a rough so i've definitely incorporated i mean basically right now how i look at it is like I understand the principle of it. I understand the fundamentals. I understand how to use it as a tool and kind of like dial it up or down as I need to, depending on how I feel. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like I went to the Ann Wigmore Institute. I would say this is definitely the moment where I spent like a few weeks there and I was the only person who was not terminal. Like I thought I was going to have a, you know, a, an experience learning about Ann Wigmore and her whole like theory behind like raw foods and juicing and wheatgrass therapy and all the rest. And I got there and I was literally the only one who wasn't there for some kind of chronic uh, illness um, or terminal. And that kind of blew my mind. And I heard stories of people who were, who had stayed there and were working and they said, you know, like I arrived with breast cancer and I left without it, or I arrived with X and like, it's not come back. I was like, this is amazing. Like I had been on the train for long enough in, in sort of like the arena in the New York city to understand like sort of you know, little stories here and there and how I felt just personally, but this was like, just felt very tangible and it felt very real. And, um, you know, unfortunately it's like, I had to go to an island. I had to sprout my own food. I had to like self-administer an enema every night, um, get colonic, you know, it was like very, very involved and very committed. Um, but, you know, the thought was like, well, why do we have to wait until we get to this point of illness before we before we do something like this. That is so extreme. And, you know, everyone there was quite extreme, even like the director and the people who work there. And I understand why, but it was kind of like, well, what if we just take this concept of raw foods and juicing and, you know, fasting, right? How we, it's so common now, um, and package it up for people who live like I do, which is sort of normal, like in an urban environment. And I can't go to an island and I can't sprout chickpeas in my bathtub and do all this stuff. Like, it's just not realistic. So it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So I think that was the point where it was like, this is way too powerful for people to not understand it and utilize it. Um, and for it to be so just, just unapproachable um, and intimidating and dogmatic and all these other things. So you know, it was like, well, what if we just do all the work for everybody? You know, it's kind of like, again, the sort of service minded, you know, mentality where it's like, okay, let me put it all together, make all the juice, chop all the vegetables, blah, blah, blah. like then, you know, deliver it to your door, literally, like you can lap it out of my hands if you want. Like how easy can we make it for people? Um, and so that's, that's the moment that was like, okay, this is what we need to do. Um, and I sort of snuck into someone's kitchen, you know, who had a, whose name shall not be mentioned. At the is this time. like is this is this like an ex boyfriend? Is that why he won't be mentioned, or is this someone that I know? <laughs> um, you probably know him. He's not an ex boyfriend, but he's probably a well known name now that had a juice company at the time. And I was like, hey. I have this idea that, um, you know, like a juice bar, like I want to create this like cleanse program and it's all about juicing and detox and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, you're cute. You can come in, like use that corner of my kitchen and like you, it's my, my staff. And I was like, okay. Hmm. And then um, that's when the test happened. And I, you know, had, I mean, it's just like one of those weird stories. Like I literally wrote like a hand note put it in the mailbox and was like dear so-and-so I have this idea can I come and he was like come on in but that was like an entire summer of using you know the staff the facility 
um, accessing clients and then organizing like at least a few months of like solid um, testing. So, you know, and, and actually charging people. So, we, you know, there's a lot of traction is definitely starting to make some money. And I was like, oh, this is like definitely going to be a, a thing. And then that person actually ended up going out of business. And um, I was like, I need to find another kitchen. And so um, I found another one. Erica, can I say how? <laughs> speaking of exes. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of exes and being scrappy. Yeah, so then I was like, oh, wait, Erica's husband has a catering company. I was like, um, do you think maybe he would like let us use a little corner? He's like, oh, you're cute guy. <laughs> I'm like, he's a corner of the kitchen. And then he also went out of business. We ended up taking over the kitchen and that was our first production facility. And it was actually a, um, you know, it was a, traditionally a catering kitchen in, in Tribeca. And Chelsea. we sort of, huh? In Chelsea. Uh, sorry, in Chelsea. And we, we just sort of, uh, you know, worked around the ovens and but we did absorb their staff so actually that was kind of like the nice the little silver yeah. lining for all of them is that they lost their catering jobs and then immediately became like juicing staff and yeah. many of them stayed on until like the end of the company which is yeah not nothing yeah that's in incredible December, yeah. In Brooklyn, yeah so um yeah I don't know, long-winded way of answering that but but yeah it is it's funny it's like it's good. We have to remind ourselves very often, even now when we're starting this next venture, because we are very much still in the startup mode, um, that like you have got to be really, really scrappy and just ask people and keep an ear to the ground and like constantly put yourself out there. I mean, that like even now, like we're finding that, I mean, my office, like, yeah, we're getting some scrappy stuff done. Let me tell you what. Um, it's I've I'm I'm, sit, I'm sitting here right now with you. I'm like I'm like I couldn't be I couldn't be I, you know I'm right there. Um, it's so interesting too. Like when I hear the story, you know, it just reminds me of you know launching a business is one of the most challenging things. Yet if you are made for it, also the most inspiring things, right? Like it's so hard, but I can't wait to do it. Like, that's like the weirdest yeah. thing about being an entrepreneur is that it's so hard, yet I just like wake up every morning just ready for war. Um, and, you know, by the end of the night, I'm just kind of like, oh, man, that was a tough day, um, but excited for tomorrow. Um, well, it also feels like you can't really picture yourself doing something else, even if you wanted to. I mean, that's kind of, you know, the, the days that it feels like it's harder than I want it to be are also the days that I'm like, but what else would I even be doing? Like, that's where you kind of have that little, you check yourself a little bit. Totally. And it's also just kind of like one thing that I've noticed. I mean, I've opened up a bunch of businesses over the last, I guess, 12, 13 years. Um, you would think that after doing it, even in a different industry, but like after doing it for a long time, that you just, it, it's easier. <laughs> it's just not it's not it's not easier it doesn't like sometimes i'm like wait have i like i've done this before dude like, like are you like, what, like why do you feel this way um but you know i think it's just human condition to kind of be in it hardcore focused and also feel like you need to ask for help every single step of the way i know for me you know asking for help is a massive massive asset that I'm comfortable admitting. I ask for as much help as I can. I really do. I ask for help all day long. Um, I'm, I, you know, and especially now where I'm so used to like the world of experience and human interaction, I'm like dealing in the world of technology and I'm just, I'm just a numb nuts when it comes to technology. I'm just not the guy. Uh, you know, I need, I need, I need, hold, I need handholding. Um, but anyway, so you guys launch, um, you launch this business and I know, cause I saw it everywhere. It was like, it was everywhere and you guys killed it. Um, and I can only imagine how well it, it went for you all. Um, how long did you, did you run that company for? Five years. Five years. And well, five years before we sold it, I'll say, and then we stayed on for another year and a half or so. So almost seven years all in. Okay. And after that seven years, did you guys like immediately start thinking about the next one or did you take a break or what, what, what happened then? 
Um, God, what happened? We did a little victory lap. Um, took a little bit of time off, not much. Um, some humans. Because we're human. And then you just get, you know. No, I said you made some humans. Oh, I made a couple humans. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had two humans. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess. Well, I was gonna say we, you know, I think we wanted to, it was, we were a little torn between um, how long can this victory lap last? And when does the window on our relevance in this world close? And I think, you know, I think that's probably <laughs> also indicative of the entrepreneurial mindset that we had um, I'm not saying I was necessarily born with it, um, I, but it was definitely cultivated in me. And I think we both felt like, okay, that was an incredible adventure, crazy journey, ridiculous. We couldn't have written it if we tried, um, but like it wasn't enough to, to just kind of sit back and rest on our laurels. We felt like, okay, well, the iron is actually hot for us now. So we need to maybe like start thinking about other ways that we want to continue this, you know, conversation for ourselves. And so we did a little bit of, you know, experimenting with some other projects to see if they had legs and, you know, they didn't. Um, and then the podcast was really the next thing that kind of came out of our decision to, you know, remain partners and keep the band together. And uh, we felt like the podcast was kind of a fun way to, you know, do exactly what you're doing and do exactly what we continue to do, which is just keep the conversation alive and, you know, seek inspiration there, um, see what's new and interesting in this world that we felt like, you know, we'll take a little bit of credit for helping to create this kind of wellness landscape of the, you know, <laughs> the mid aughts or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, uh, so that was like, you know, I don't think we ever looked at it as like a be all end all. And we certainly didn't look at it as a revenue opportunity, but we looked at it as a way to just continue a conversation in a different way. Um, but the ethos was always the same, which is, you know, with juice, it was like, let's take this thing that feels weird and, and fringy and bring it to the masses in a mainstream way. Um, and that was the same idea with a podcast, which was like, there's a couple wellness podcasts out there. This is three years ago. Um, very few, if any of them were hosted by women with the exception of one Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and even fewer of them were hosted by people who had actually really been in the trenches and you know built a business in addition to actually being the, the wellness enthusiasts that we were and are. So we felt like, you know, we do have a unique voice here. Let's also make it a little bit fun because this shit gets real dogmatic and preachy real fast. And mm. we definitely wanted to try to avoid the whole like weller than thou, you know, <coughs> halo around our, our, our personas and our, our own business attitudes because that doesn't serve anybody. Um, I, so I'm just trying to timeline this. So you guys started 2007, you sold it in 2012-ish. You guys stayed on till 2015-ish. You like took a year to fucking like live up a little bit, spend a little <laughs> cash, have some babies, um, year and a half maybe. Then you buy start some, thinking. Buy some horses, you know. Buy a few horses. <laughs> um, and then you get back together and you're like, hey, we're going to try some other shit. Try some other shit. Doesn't really take off the way you think it's going to. And it's now 2017, 18. And you're like, all right, we're going to do this podcast thing. And we're going to, we're going to try to drum up some inspiration on the pod. And, um, and then all of a sudden you guys decide to get into the world of mushrooms. Let's talk about mushrooms. Cause I think mushrooms are, I mean, you know, <laughs> mushrooms, the magical mushrooms are a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I've had I've had some good old time on a good old mushroom. Um, I, I remember very well, actually, to be totally transparent. I don't remember much, but I will say that the things that I do remember were very fun in Amsterdam with my best friend. Um, and we went there in 2000 and uh, this has got to be. 20 years ago so what was that 2001 two maybe uh and we said we're gonna go to amsterdam and we're gonna eat mushrooms every day all day <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> and, and by golly, well, we've accomplished that one. We when you did set it. out to do something. You know, when you put your mind to it, kid. Um, but we went out there and man, oh man, was that a wild trip. Uh, no pun intended or pun intended. But I, um, you know, mushrooms have taken on a whole new, uh, a whole new um, sort of facade. And um, I would love to learn about them. You guys created Earth and Star not too long ago, um, and it's a functional mushroom company. Uh, and you guys make these awesome, delicious beverages, and they're they're the formulas essentially comp comprised of mushrooms. Um, and so, like, a why mushrooms? B what are why what do mushrooms do for us? And C <laughs> how do you get people excited to want to ingest? mushrooms um in a you know on a regular basis yeah it's a tricky question i mean it's a it's definitely not um super straightforward and it's not that dissimilar to blueprint and that it's like huh how do you get people excited about drinking green juice and uh not eating for days that and, was tough you know getting a colonic every once in a while. I mean, like, you know, it was a very unsexy kind of like sell, like until we kind of- Well, can, but can I just in a sentence say something about that? Like, and I, I totally get the motivation of the company was not to like lose 10 pounds in a week. However, right. when you stop eating food and you drink juice for seven to 10 days straight, there's two things that happen outside of just the, you know, healing inside of your body. Right. I, cause I've done a bunch of these cleanses. One, you absolutely lose weight when you stop eating and drink juice, right? Unless you're drinking a lot of juice, which is, you know, like, unless you're, unless you're drinking 2,200 calories worth of juice every day, but you definitely do lose weight on the juice cleanse. Um, and two mentally for me, what would happen on a juice cleanse was by far and away, more interesting than the weight loss. It was like after day four or five, I started to feel sharp as a tack. I will say also potentially sometimes uh, I I would the I was very irritable, uh, like I would snap on people um, if I something was said that I didn't really like um, on a five day fifth day of a juice cleanse. But I will say that like the focus level that I got on those cleanses, I remember like feeling light on my feet like seeing everything a little bit clearer in this, you know, as I was walking around the city, I remember like very vividly saying this to myself, oh my God, it's five days. I feel like a different human. Um, and so adding that to the mix, especially the weight loss component, like I think is, it makes it a little bit um, like that is how you can, you know, th there's a spin on saying, hey, like, yeah, you're going to actually, this is really good for you, but also you know, there's, you, you can lose, you can lose a couple of pounds that you yeah. potentially want to take off. Yeah. I think that that's a very good point. Um, so mushrooms, I think we were definitely, uh, you know, not so intentionally looking for something to do like another brand to build. Um, it just kind of happened over a few conversations where it was like, Oh, wait a minute. We'd both been taking, um, functional mushroom supplements in one form or another, like powders or instant coffee or tinctures, or, you know, there's a lot of uh, pill forms out there and powders. Um, and we had just a moment where we noted that like, this has really uh, made a pretty big difference in my life. And I don't notice it until I stop taking it, which is very true to like with a lot of adaptogens. It's like, it's a loading process. You have to kind of build it in your system. You're meant to take it every day. Um, and, you know, it's it's somewhat subtle, um, some of the things uh, that you feel, but for the most part, you you feel them um, pretty intensely, I think, uh, if you stop taking, when you stop taking them. Um, but we just kind of looked around and thought like, okay, this is a fascinating category. Like, why does this, why do these mushrooms work? Like, what the hell is going on here? What is this? And just kind of took a, a closer look and, um, you know, pulled the, the thread on the, the fungi kingdom, 
in the same way that we did with the plant kingdom. And it was like, this is some powerful shit. Like, oh my God, this is like truly undiscovered territory, at least in the West. You know, I mean, these are sort of ancient remedies and this has been around for a long time, but no one has really um, sort of revisited this, this kingdom and the, the health benefits of functional mushrooms um, in, a, in a new way. And so we thought that was a really exciting opportunity. There's nothing on the market um, and there's still really nothing, not much on the market, although it's, they're coming, um, that, that was um, convenient, delicious, uh, like beautifully branded. Everything was just sort of in this uh, powder, you know, powder form, pill form. And like, I don't know about you, but I have, I take so many supplements every day. I mean, <clears throat> my cabinet is just like packed and I don't want another, I don't need to add to that list. So it was like, okay, how can we take again, something that is insanely functional, healthy, um, and package it up in a way that tastes amazing. Um, that is, you know, truly a therapeutic, like efficacious dose. Um, and then, you know, something that is also consumer friendly, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a complicated, um, area. And I think it's often, you know, gets overly sciencey in the speak. Uh, it's hard to break down and sort of summarize very quickly what functional mushrooms do for you because they do so many things. Um, and so once you start rattling off the list, it sounds like, it, it's, it sounds crazy. It's like, you can't, it sounds magical, I guess I should say. Um, but yeah, so we thought we know beverage, let's put our beverage hats back on. Um, there's no one in the ready, to, there's no one delivering this in a ready to drink format. Um, yet and so we we got busy and we spent like a solid two years doing r d um formulating this and figuring out how to get um this very functional compound in products that people consume every day you know we don't want to ask we don't want to ask people to take on another habit or change their habit. Um, we wanted to find the things that people were already doing, which is drinking coffee, um, lattes, and just enhance them with the benefits of functional mushrooms. So thus, Earth and Star was born. I'll stop there. I've been talking for a really long time. I love it. Um, so <laughs> why don't you quickly talk to us about Earth and Star, the name, and, and sort of get into that because I, I I also feel like naming a company um, is is really hard to do um, and sometimes it just rolls off your tongue and then other times it's a it's an arduous process. Earth and Star, Erica, let's have it. It was it was not um, it was definitely not the first name that we landed on, but I actually think that in retrospect it it works really well for a lot of reasons. Um, but to your point, yeah, it is not easy to name a company because all the good shit is taken now. That's just where we are. I mean, if we try to name Blueprint now, forget it. There'd be no way. Um, the fact that we got Blueprint and then a little while later got Blueprint.com is it seems impossible. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Oh, we paid. No, I know, but we still got it. Um, yeah. But so Earth and Star, you know, there were a lot of different iterations. We definitely wanted to make sure that it felt consumer friendly, um, that it sort of in, encapsulated both the this, you know, to the point that we've been making, there's a little bit of like a magical kind of, you know, mystical element of the healing power of these plants or fungi. But also that, um, you know, that it's actually real and that there's some science behind it and it's not just a whole bunch of, you know, snake oil. Um, and so we kind of started playing around with the idea of looking at um, this, the concept of like a duality, right? So that's where the ampersand came from um, because there actually is a mushroom called an earth star. So there are all sorts of amazing, cool species of, of mushrooms out there, 10,000 plus at this point. Um, but there's one called an earth star that has its own like interesting, you know, properties. It's actually able to like move itself a little bit. It sort of opens and closes with the sun and the rain and the elements, which is fascinating and crazy. Um, 
and uh, we're not using an earth star mushroom in any of our formulations. So that would have been, would have been a little too literal, but this notion of duality um, where first of all, it's Zoe and Erica. Second of all, it's, you know, it's mushrooms and coffee, mushrooms and chocolate. It's mushrooms and the vehicle that's actually delivering them. And the idea is really around the, like, you know, keeping yourself grounded while also, you know, really reaching for the stars. I mean, you can get a little precious with it, but, um, but we kind of think of it as just really achieving the ultimate balance. It's the earth and it's the star. It's, you know, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So, you know, I was thinking about the name, uh, I think it was yesterday in anticipation of our, uh, podcast today. And I just think, it, I thought, I think it's a cool ass name. I think being able to like, if you really think about the name, like, you know, there's a lot of space between the earth and the stars, right? There's a lot of space. So there's this opportunity like everywhere between the earth and the stars, endless, endless opportunity. And so that, that interpretation. for me, for me, that's what it came down to. Like, I was like, literally, I was, it was, it was like right at, after meditating in the morning and I was like earth and star. And I was like, thinking about the earth and I was like, boom, the star way the fuck up here. And I was like, there's so much opportunity between those two things. I love that. Um, can we, can we use that and not? It's all yours. Too? It's, it's all, so you could totally take it. You could say, well, maybe if you want to say from a person that we will choose not to mention um, <laughs> yes. right now. <laughs> from an ex um, podcast guest. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, all right. So I'm drinking the turmeric here, which has been really delicious throughout the whole the whole podcast um, and it's nice and it's rich and it's really like you guys nailed flavor profile. Um, you, it's got in here, it's got oat milk, lion's mane, reishi, cordyceps and chaga. Here's the interesting thing. I'd love for you guys to sort of tell us, is there a time of day that you, you suggest drinking this thing or is it just like whenever it floats your boat? Because I do know that it is functional and you've kind of blended these four different mushrooms that have different properties. And, and so I guess the question is, because I know for me, when I first started taking mushrooms or, you know, functional mushrooms, not the magic kind, um, I would, I would take cordyceps uh, in, 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 in uh, like in place of a pre-workout, right? So like, if I wanted to, if I, like, if I knew I was going to the gym in the afternoon, I always had a little thing of cordyceps that I drop into um, a thing of water and I'd shake it up and I drink it and I would actually get like this like pump of energy. Um, but you also have Rishi in here for calm and lion's mane for focus. So you sort of made this like really cool cocktail of all the sort of all the, all the functional mushrooms that I have, I know and have experience with. Is there, is there like a, is there a specific sort of feeling that one would assume or one can potentially get from, from, experiencing earth and star based on this concoction or is it just like this is just for better living um I, I would say that this is a it's funny because i know everybody wants to um everybody wants to focus on you know the specific like calm energy focus you know whatever it is um but adaptogens are neat in that they are constantly figuring out where you're sort of lacking or where you're overstimulated. And so that is like, um, you know, this sort of synergistic effect that we're trying to, trying to highlight here is that they're actually stronger together. Um, and so it's not to say that if you don't have something really specific that you're going after that you shouldn't just take that one thing, like for your example, with the cordyceps, it's fine. But I think for a daily habit, um, these are sort of four mushrooms that check a lot of boxes for people. Um, things that we're typically struggling with, whether it's focus or energy calm, um, immune support. And so adaptogens work literally like a thermostat and they will find these areas where you're either too hot or too cold or too, you know, maybe a little running a little too high and it will, maybe they will calm you down, you know. So they're trying to constantly get you in this sort of state of like homeostasis and balance and that's what we're we're trying to achieve with this that is so cool i actually didn't know that about adaptogens um that they're kind of like um they're like a friend looking for your soft spot or and it's an hard. area yeah, yeah i mean it's hard it's, it's um it's a hard thing to 
to sort of comprehend that this that this fung fungi or plant or whatever it is or herb or root can be so um, intuitive, intelligent, I was right? Say intelligent, yeah. And so, but that is that is their inherent value. I mean, that is what they're bringing to the table. They're 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 helping you adapt on a moment to moment basis. You know, um, so functional mushrooms for the most part fall under this umbrella of adaptogens, which I think is another buzzy word that people are still somewhat confused about and they kind of know it's good, but don't know why, but so they're sort of um, one and the same. And so I think guys, also yeah. to add on to that, sorry, um, but I think, you know, that from a formulation standpoint, that's really what makes <laughs> sense. Like Zoe was saying, this kind of entourage effect where they all sort of help to amplify each other and then balance and modulate where you need it. But strictly from just a marketing and, and customer experience point of view, we wanted to make it just, we wanted to sort of reduce the amount of decision-making that you have to make. So we actually initially launched with a turmeric formula that had one specific mushroom in it and a cacao formula that had another, but we realized that we were asking the consumer to choose both flavor and then also function and it was becoming a little too confusing. So we felt like this is much more direct way of saying, you're gonna get all of these benefits and because adaptogens have these capabilities that they do to modulate where you need it, um, all we're asking you to do is choose whether you want your afternoon, you know, not afternoon, but your, your turmeric experience, your golden latte, whenever you like to have that. Do you want your actual coffee with your, you know, your cold brew? Um, whatever it is, just choose the flavor and then let the function kind of come in where, you know, to, to fill in wherever it needs to. So that's so cool. So you guys, so when did you launch exactly? Mm, we don't um, know exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so murky, right? I mean, we launched during the pandemic. So it's like, <sighs> Are we good? Can we leave our house? I don't know. Can we start? Like, it was just a very confusing uh, moment to pinpoint. But roughly, we sort of were in beta mode last year, um, like end of summer. So end of summer, you could say probably 2020. Um, now it's whatever month it is, May uh, 2021. So we've, we've more officially launched, I think, this year um, in January. And we can more clearly mark that launch date by the fact that you know we're we're entering retail um which feels a little bit more tangible so you guys are entering retail up until now it's been direct to consumer um i'm assuming and yeah. direct to consumer beverage is not easy um and so you guys are i'm, I'm sure excited to be stepping into retail even though it's costly and a real it's a, it's a tough, it's a, I mean, I think, I think CPG in general is just a tough business, but so is every fucking business, right? Yeah. Like every, every business is a tough business, you know, like I'm stepping into, into the business, uh, you know, direct to consumer CPG. And, you know, there are people like, well, you should just know it's a really tough competitive business. And I'm like, you know, yes, absolutely. <laughs> but so is every business right that's that 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 has success stories right like every single business that has a success story or two or three is a challenging business to step into um we've been on on here for a long time i mean this is you guys are like you guys are are awesome to talk to um and i i guess i want to close out with a few a few um a few other questions or just a few of them um and I'd like to sort of just get an answer from the two of you because I do think that this this question is is changing. What is wellness? I mean, I think it's it's so highly personalized. It's where it's whatever practices or um, elements that you need in order to feel that you are operating optimally, and that doesn't have to be a product. And it doesn't have to be a class. It could be as simple as the thing that you read that sort of helps you feel like you have the perspective that you're going for. I think it's the tools that you need to feel that you're performing <laughs> optimally. And it could span any anything. Yeah, I think it's most easily that you eat or the, the what you body 
whether it's food or fitness um, or, you know, mental wellness, meditation practices, all that, that or the, whatever it is, you know, whatever, like I said, whatever daily thing they're doing, their wellness practice. And who am I to judge that? That's, that's my definition of it. Um, how important are habits um, for you guys? Um, it's my doorbell. Um, habits. Oh, God, you know. I hate to put too much pressure on habits. I mean, I think it's just sort of, a, it can sort of backfire very easily. Um, I would I would love to say that I have all these healthy habits that I do every day. I mean, the truth is I'm very sporadic. I think I I'm kind of following like whatever I feel like I need that day. I mean, the only habit I think I want to be in is the one that is like really tuned into what I need in that particular moment. Um, as opposed to sort of getting on this wheel and forcing this like repetitive, whatever it is for the sake of doing it, because you said you had to make it a habit for reasons that maybe existed previously and, you know, maybe don't exist in the moment. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think I have a, um, I don't think I have a very strong stance on habits. Do you um, guys have any advice for the person who is ready to take a leap, ready to ready to step into the world of of creating their own um, their own journey, and and uh, is just like needs just a little push over the edge just to take the leap? Do you guys have any advice for that person? From a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, I have so much advice. I don't know. Where do I? Start? I don't want. I think it goes with what we were early saying earlier in terms of Michael. You're saying you know you're never afraid to ask for help. We both very you know very um, vehemently agree with that. I think it is. Don't be afraid of asking questions don't be afraid of thinking that you don't know because you probably don't know, but knowing that you don't know is, is a huge piece of it and accepting that you don't know and getting over the ego factor, I think is, is a big part of it. Mm. Yeah. I Sorry, Zoe, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'll, uh, no, I think I'll just expand on that. I think, yeah, I've, a lot of it is, um, I think it's very easy to kind of sit down and say like, this is what I want to do. Now let me plan out all the steps and this is how I'm going to get there. And, you know, it has to go this way. I mean, I think once you do that, it makes it very hard to start because you're never going to be able to plan out all of those steps. So it's like a lot of it is just like, you have to just start and have confidence that you'll be able to figure it out as you go. And that things will ultimately come up that you did not plan for. And in those moments, you will certainly have to do some creative problem solving. Yeah, I think taking the first step is probably the biggest hurdle, but you have to take it. I agree. Unless it's a crappy idea. If it's a horrible idea, just don't do it. That's another big piece of advice. Not all ideas are good ideas. I've had plenty of shit ideas. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, that should not have been pursued. All right, you too. Uh, I always wrap up this podcast with asking the question, do you think you were born or made? Let's start with you, Erica. I mean, I know it's easy, but it's definitely both. I think I, I'm probably, I would give you a ratio maybe and say 60% uh, born, 40% made. Okay, that's fair. So... Oh God. Um, I don't know. I think it's obvious, you know, it's both. It's weird having kids now because I look at them and I'm like, oh God, they are already who they're going to be. Like, yeah. Moments, That's like, what, yep. They're like, like one just turned six and the other just turned four. And I'm like, you're already like fully formed. Like your personality is what it is. I don't know. So sometimes I'm just like, maybe you are is kind of born maybe the rate maybe it's like 70 they do say that niceness is like a gene you know what i mean like you are <laughs> born with a certain amount of niceness it's bizarre oh another funny fact 
I read that for, I think it was like 46% of your IQ is acquired throughout your life, as opposed to, you know, they say you're born with a certain interesting. IQ and that's it. A lot of it is actually acquired. I agree with you with the kids thing. I look at both of my sons. They were both born, you know, interestingly enough, they were both from the same litter, except born two and a half years apart because we did IVF. Um, and, um, and so they were, bo- they were, you know, cut from the same era. Um, and um, my younger son is just an absolute knucklehead. Like he is, he does not, he is hilarious. He is going to be the class clown. He is, he dances in front of everyone. Like I caught him the other day, we were having pizza at a restaurant upstate and we're sitting in this restaurant and I look over at Dakota and he's going like this. (laughs) And I look across the room and he's doing that to some (laughs) like, like 12 year old girl to take him across the, across the way. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he was like, (laughs) I was like, oh my God, this guy is out of control. And my other son is just the sweetest, kindest, most warm, cuddly, cuddly little, you know, he's the older one, but uh, I think we're born. Um, you guys are, are the best. Where can we find you? Can you just tell us the name of the podcast and, and where we can get Earth and Star? Yeah, the podcast is HTW Highway to Well with Erica and Zo- with Zoe and Erica, HTW podcast. <laughs> Um, and the product, yeah, you can get all things Earth and Star at earthandstar.com. And we have a whole um, slew of products, other products beyond uh, lattes coming out. So everything will be infused with functional mushrooms. So cool. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. This was a really, really fun uh, experience with y'all um, and fun journey and, and learning about you two and your new stuff. And uh, I think people are going to get a lot of uh, a lot of good, a lot of goodness out of it. Thank you. Oh, thank Thanks, you so much. I appreciate thank it. You. Have a great rest thank of your day, guys. Thanks. You too.